Oh, Sharon is on there. Sharon, we've been praying for Paul again. <clears throat> All right. We, um, I guess we're ready. We, um, last class, which is hard to remember, because <laughs> I teach three classes in this thing and then travel <laughs> and teach somewhere else. <clears throat> Seemed like we talked about he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Does that sound familiar? Anything? All right. Yeah. What? Well, actually, it wasn't the stars. It was God the Father that he believed in and his view of the Son and that it filled his um, scope. What was the question? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I'll build back up to that again. Um, but, well, I guess, yeah, we can read that. That's verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Okay, so um, there's probably several reasons why he would ask that. Um, one that comes into my mind is that... Um, the Lord, the Father, God just showed him, you know, this majestic view and picture of his, uh, his concept or his uh, way of viewing the sun in massive amounts of stars, which back then, since there was no lights, incandescent or otherwise, LED, uh, you could probably see a bunch. But um, in that, I think that maybe there was this big uh, thing that hit him that, oh my God, this is massive. And he's thinking of one thing then, whereby shall I know? He's going, because I have no ability in myself. He was, remember, he was old. Um, I have no ability in myself to produce, to reproduce, to produce. Thank you, sir. And um, um, <clears throat> okay, so you, that's a nice statement, but how can we make that impacting to us. Uh, in, in us, we have no ability to bring forth Christ. We may want him. We may search the scriptures. We may cry out in prayer and say, Father, form your son in me. I want him to come forth, just like Abraham and Sarah. There's, you know, I want that. I've been believing for that. We've been through a lot. Um, you keep promising, <laughs> but I'm not seeing what I would like to see of the Lord come forth. Whereby shall I know? Can you, if you follow that line of thought, then it's, then we can, we can start grasping it because it's like, how is this going to happen? How will this, how can I know that this is going to happen? And, and, um, <clears throat> You know, you can't just say, uh, uh, I'm going to be Christ-like, poof, you know. <clears throat> you can do that, but that's called Ishmael. <laughs> and we're not ready for Ishmael yet. Um, <clears throat> so, and Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. And so maybe, maybe Abram is a, um, a realist. Maybe for him... It is uh, difficult for him to fool himself. Do you, anybody know what I'm talking about? To, to go, oh, okay, yeah, you know, to believe something about against what he sees in that sense unless he believes God and not in himself. And um, 
You know, I mean, ultimately that's the bottom line. But the real bottom line was when he saw all those stars and he, and he was, the father says, says, remember it says he took him to a place where he could see this. <clears throat> and he saw the reaction of the father. That's where faith's going to come. You believe God. You don't believe stars. You know. And you don't believe God because he's saying, uh, he's looking up and going, you're going to have a bunch. You know, there's going to be a bunch. And he's going, you know, you're looking there, God, but I'm looking here. And that's where we usually look. But it didn't say he believed in himself. He didn't believe in his ability to bring forth Christ. He believed that he was really a man of God and he was going to get after it and he would be eventually called the friend of God and all the things that did come to pass. He, he didn't have any of that. He wondered, I am sure, he wondered, you know, about himself. He had questions about himself. He had, he, he, you know, he probably hoped, but, you know, hope is looking for something that, you know, is not there yet. And faith is believing that it's, you know, and uh, not just, well, I hope so, because I've done that, you know. I, um, um, I, I remember praying for people uh, who wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I would say, okay, well, um, uh, I usually go through a little thing. I do it with water baptism and everything. When I, when I do any of these rituals, although they're, they're of God and all that, when I do them, I usually go through this process of asking certain questions according to the Word of God. And, and with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I say, um, <clears throat> uh, Jesus said, anyone who asks for the Holy Spirit, of course, this is in the context of not just that one thing. I've already asked him several questions and several more because it's not just that you believe that. It's the full body of the facts. But I say, you know, do you believe that, you know, if you ask him, you'll receive the Holy Spirit? And he said, I hope so. And I went, we're going to have to step a little further than that, buddy, because I ain't going to ask you the next question, you know. I mean, Jesus said, if you ask, and again, that uh, we're not, you know, there's a whole body of things that I share so that it all comes together and gels and I was about halfway through that body of it, but he, you know, and so we talked a little more about it, and um, and then we prayed, and he received. But um, there is a day when you have to move from hope, you know. I mean, you have to move from just well, I hope so, because hope can be every day. Well, I hope so. Well, I hope so, and then it's just a constant thing that. Um, the example I use is a, a donkey with a, uh, a um, switch tied to it with a rope hanging down and a carrot at the front of it. And you're always, that donkey is always going, that's how you get them to go because <laughs> they're stubborn. So you just hang that there and say, giddy up. And he goes, yeah, you know, and he's going after it. See, we say, well, he's, he's carrying me to my destination. No, he's hungry and wants a carrot. Okay. But he's, he's hoping to get that every time. You know, he doesn't go, I ain't going anymore because this is stupid. You never give me the care. You know, well, God, in most of the cases of the things that we're hoping for, it's already settled in his heart. And that's this picture of him doing with the stars and everything. That's already settled in his heart. He's not even, he doesn't even have to think of Abraham all he's got to do is think of his son and the vastness of how he is in his own heart. And he, you can be assured, you can come to faith, you can leave hope and come to faith. But that's going to require you looking away from yourself, your failures. My, well, my patterns always lead me to, you know, just shut up. You know, I mean, that's, you know, yes, they will until Christ is formed in you. 
And um, <clears throat> some of you have heard me mention this when I was seeking the Lord. And, and uh, it occurred to me that my seeking, I was going, I just want you, Lord, I want you. And then it occurred to me that a lot, and this is, you know, this has actually been several years ago uh, when I had brown hair. Um, and, um, and I really want you. And this was in Bible school, and I said, um, and I'd been going that way and pursuing and reading the scriptures and, you know, going, and I said, and all of a sudden one day I thought, you know, I want him, I want Christ revealed in me for me so that, number one, I could come to a revelation of Christ. Number two, people would go, oh, he came to a revelation of Christ. You know, on and on and on, I was going down, and I went, oh, Father, you know, I am selfishly seeking your son. And he said, that's okay. When you get the son, you won't be selfish anymore. <laughs> and I was like, yay! <laughs> you know? And uh, so that was his view. I could have stayed in my view and just gone, you know, I'm hopeless because even in seeking the, seeking the Lord to be revealed in me, I'm extremely selfish and there is no hope for me. I mean, you know, forget faith. There's no hope. Well, that's the fallacy. You don't look at yourself. It did, again, it says he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It didn't say he became righteous and it was counted to him for believing. <laughs> I don't know. Because it's a matter of where you look. It's a matter of the heart. And, um, and you know, God did that with Abraham even before this time. You know, look above, you know. And uh, rem remember that Lot was checking out the land and he picked the best land and Abraham looked up and it, it is significant of um, not being bound by this earth, not your focus just always here, not, you know, if there's a God, do all of this stuff for me like Lot did rather, you know, um, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth, you know. And, I mean, I even remember that. It was like Colossians 3, 3, you know, or 3, 1 through 3. And, uh, you know, if you be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above. And I'm going, are you talking about um, streets of gold? Because <laughs> this was the concepts that Christianity taught. Are you talking about seek a mansion? Are you talking about um, being happy eternally in the eternal city? Uh, no, he said where Christ sits. I said, well, what's where Christ sits? And he said, Christ. You know, you're going, well, don't make it so hard. Just say it, Lord. You know, he's going, well, don't be so dumb. Just say it. You know. And then the next verse, he says, for you're dead. Okay, well, then, yes. Seek, seek where Christ seated to be seated with him and in his life. Instead of trusting a, a, a pile of flesh, a pile of seething, whining flesh called me. But rather, let it be the Lord. Let it be him. Let my heart turn from me. Uh, and we say, see, we say that. Well, okay. I know my heart has to turn from me to Jesus but then we're, we still look at ourselves and, and get discouraged. I mean, has anybody ever done that? 
How many hands on Skype? Let me see. Oh, a lot of them. Okay. <clears throat> Praise God. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so he asked that question. <clears throat> he asked, and um, and he asked it, responding to the challenge that God gave in the sense of um, showing God the Father, showing this man his heart for his son. And him having faith for about hmm, at least 30 seconds until he asked how. But in a certain sense, it really wasn't a step away from faith. It was trying to step forward to it. Okay, great. I believe you. You counted it to me for righteousness. That's great. You got a little bored and you wrote it down and said, see, I counted it to you. You go, I, that's not helping me. <laughs> How? How shall this be? You know, whereby is the, I think the exact word, holy moly. <clears throat> uh, and uh, more hands. <clears throat> so, um, I think it's. I think it can be a good question. I think it can be. I'm not satisfied um, to have promises or to to see things in you. Um, that's good. I do believe. But you said it was the sun was going to come out of me. So I'm not going to take away from that or this or any of these things. But I, I'm not going to stop my pursuit. You know, I am not, you know, just going to settle back and go, well, okay, everything's good. You know, and the father's, you know, the father could look at him and say, good, I, I count that to you for righteousness, but I want my son in you. Also, he could, the father could say it just like he can. And, he, and the father could say, I don't really just want belief. I don't really just want a belief system. I have a belief system. It's my Christian belief system. And the Father goes, that's, that's worth absolutely nothing to me. Where is my son? Okay, well, <clears throat> except <clears throat> the Father knows, and the Father, first of all, the Father is working. It's an appointed time of the Father. And the Father's working the plan. He is faithful. He is consistent. He is moving forward. But he has to get us in the right place. We don't even know what that is. We don't. And if somebody tells you what it is, you know what? We'll try to get there, but we'll, we'll make a fake version of it and go, I got there, okay. You know, and with, you know, expectation to go, okay, I'm ready. Reveal your son, and he'll go, uh, you know, keep moving. <clears throat> Forward, of course, but. <laughs> um, so, uh, so he says um, in verse 9 and 10, and he said unto him, this is, this is the, an answer to whereby shall I know? He said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. <clears throat> and he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against the other, but the birds divided he not. <clears throat> and so basically, the, when Abraham asked, How will this happen? Whereby shall I know that this is going to take place? The whereby is the knowledge of the cross. It has to be. It has to be. There, there's going to be an altar for you or the son that you want, right? There's going to be an altar. 
And this is how this right now we're going to do an offering. We're going to do this thing, um, but um, uh, this is going to be a representation of how you're going to know you're going to have the son that I want which I don't want to give too much away there, but there is, there is a lot there. <clears throat> and so the altar is the assurance. It's the assurance of, and it's the knowledge of whereby. This is how you're going to know. And I, and you know, remember now, Abraham, how many altars have we already had from this man? I mean, he's, a, he's an altar man, you know. He's not an altar boy. He's an altar man. And he is... Again, but this time, <clears throat> God is ordering the altar. The other times it didn't say, God said, give me a sacrifice. The other times it didn't say, here's exactly what I want. It never, <clears throat> it, you know, I was thinking about it, and it never actually even gives you a hint that Abraham understood fully what those altars meant. It was, he was just doing them. But this time the Lord said, okay, yeah. You're going to talk about my son? You're going to ask me for the son in you? You're going to truly talk friend to friend, as it were, face to face in relationship to this? Then I'm going to order the, the sacrifice this time. I'm going to be the one that tells you what I want, okay? And the sacrifices that he mentions there <clears throat> are all of the sacrifices that Israel was ordered, uh, gave the, the, the format for in the wilderness when they were at Mount Sinai uh, for the tabernacle. They were all, all of the, all of that. They're all there. He had the full view of Christ crucified. And every aspect that each one of those things represented later on that they would find. God didn't explain it, but he said, this is it. I'm going to give you the full picture of Christ crucified. And he could have at that time said, now this, the, the, you know, this represents this, and this represents that, and this represents that. But he just said, this is what I want. Give me, give me all of these aspects so that I see Jesus and so that you can see not just Jesus, but Christ crucified. So that you can comprehend that this is not a, an event um, and a one-time sacrifice. But this will stand for all the sacrifices until we get to the main one in chapter 22, right? <clears throat> so he said, um, And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against the other, but the birds divided he not. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, I probably should read a little bit here. <clears throat> Abram hears God's word and sees God himself in a vision. Okay, so he, God had spoken to him before this. God had spoken to him before this. Come to him and spoke to him by the word of the Lord and had appeared to him in a vision. Um, and, then, and then Abram asks, how shall I know? And God didn't give him the typical charismatic answer. He didn't say, I, I spoke to you through my word. Get in the word. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, 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 here's how you'll know. I just appeared to you. You've just had a supernatural vision of me. You know, we would do that. You know, somebody would grab hold of that, and they would go. <clears throat> I mean, some people, if they were Abraham, they would they would go. God's promising, you know, that you're going to have His son, even though they may not fully understand what that means. 
and they would go running out rejoicing and starting a great evangelistic ministry of God's word ministry through the vision of Christ incorporated and then invite everyone to come and say would you like to have a vision of God because I did would you like to hear God's word to you then come forward to the altar where the offering plates are. I don't know. Somebody would do that. Yeah, Scott? Yeah. Scott was talking about the contrast of Saul and King Saul and King David's beginnings. And I mean, the Lord really did do a lot of supernatural things and special things um, for Saul and, you know, drew him out. <clears throat> and David, even at the height of Samuel anointing him, it wasn't as glorious as it looked because nobody said, I bet it's David until it, he was the last one. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, really? You know, can you see David? He's 16, you know. Really? I'm the last one. I've been with my father's sheep. Hear that young voice? I've been with my father's sheep. But we, we always want, yeah, see, I mean, I understand this because I came through that, that door. I worked in, with uh, Kenneth Copeland's prayer team for a while, and, and I saw all kind of miracles and stuff, and I was wowed. I mean, I was. I was wowed by all of that was going on. And when I went to Bible school and left that, ministry <clears throat> I that's one of the that was one of the areas I'd stand up and rebuke the church when I would do that because they would say stuff or whatever and I'm going you know and in fact in fact I mean Deb can tell you this when I first got there I would lay hands on Bereans and they'd get healed and I would get get them filled with the Holy Spirit and all this stuff and in, here's my mind. This isn't God's mind. Here's my mind. <clears throat> Someone would come up and go, you know, it's not really about that. It's about the cross. <laughs> and I would go, well, if you're talking about who has God, I can't do these miracles. So you figure it out. <laughs> and uh, because, you know, God's showing up, you know. And in my little mind, I mean, that really was... You know, I mean, look, this is God. This isn't me, you know. And then the Spirit of God started talking to me, showing up after I would rebuke someone in, in the church. My God. And, and he would. He would show up and he would go, okay, Randy. You know, that was real precious, how, what you just did back there. <clears throat> But then, like David, then everything starts going wrong. I mean, he, he comes in, and it looks exciting. Uh, but the more that he does for the king, the worse it gets for him. You know, he goes and, you know, the king makes it hard by saying, well, go get, you know, kill a certain amount of Philistines and, the, you know, you know, yeah, and all of that stuff. And then he, you know, and so David goes, goes and does it and then does a little extra, you know. And uh, the king goes, you know, he just gets jealous over it. And then David ends up running for his life and spends the first third of his life running and being looked at as a, a rogue 
agent in the kingdom. Well, look at what God did with David during that time. Read the Psalms, you know, because that's a, you know, I don't know if y'all have done that, but this, if you read like uh, Samuel and the ones that talk about David's life, and then you go over into the Psalms, there are many of the Psalms will state what, what David said when he was in the cave Abdullah. So you can read the story and then go over here and hear his heart. You know, because we could read just the story and we go, well, I bet he's hacked off in, the, in that cave. He's upset, I bet. No, man, he's seeking the Lord. He's getting the Lord out of the problems instead of, instead of you know, he's growing in the Lord instead of having a God that has to clear the way. Just make, you know, just make everything perfect for me. But he's really learning Christ crucified. He's learning the life of Christ. And he talks about the living God. And he talks about the Lord is my strength. And everyone else around him is praying for strength. And he's not praying for strength. He's praying for the Lord who would be his strength. And on and on and on. And he, and he says, he picks up the book. He picks up the Bible. He picks up the book. And he, and he, and he prays things that are unheard of at that time. Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. At that time, well, brother, you just read it. Just read it. You don't need your eyes open. It's just literal. Just read it. Well, him and Paul seem to differ, you know. He's saying to the law even, though. This isn't even the New Testament. To the law, open my eyes that I may behold. Not tell me what page to read. And, you know, Paul comes along and says the same thing, you know, that you have to have Christ revealed from the word, but revealed in you. And that that's the whole plan of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations is now made known. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, thanks for that comment. <laughs> um, so, when he says, whereby shall I know, God's response is, he begins to talk to him in crucified language. It's crucified language. Take this. Take this. Let's put it to death. This is the language of God. This is the way that God speaks. This is the way that the, the eternal God communicates his heart. And in that, and, and there'll come a revelation out of this. You, you know that, right? But it's not going to be what you think. Because we're looking for certain things. You know, I remember when people talk about a revelation of Christ to me when I was younger. I had a, I had a totally different view of what it was from what happened. I mean... I had this, I don't know, man, it was, mine was supercharged, <laughs> you know, it was like, whoa, you know, and, um, and his, his version of it wasn't anything in the realm of this great, glorious thing, and, and that's what we'll see here. Um, but let me go ahead and finish reading this part. Um, before God imparts any words of direction for his life or any great teaching that would inspire his faith, he presents the altar. Okay. Uh, okay, Lord, you promised, you showed me stars and men. It was just, uh, 
I even saw like supernovas in that and constellations and I even saw like three quasars. He's just, you know, I'm talking about my son. And he's not trying to inspire his faith for things beyond the natural. He's trying to inspire his faith for someone who would come in the natural and literally do what no one else would do, die for everybody that doesn't deserve it. These deaths here represent my son more than these stars. These deaths right here represent his spirit more than, um, more than even my admiration for him. These deaths right here are the pinnacle of who he is and what he will do when he arrives. This is just so that you'll know that these deaths are him and they're greater than all of that. They're greater. They're, and to me, it's more unfathomable and to me it is more far reaching but that's that was just a picture to to let you know the greatness of the heart I have for him but this is him this dead things this is him crucified language crucified mindset, crucified uh, uh, promises, because the promises aren't going to be any good until there's a crucified. In fact, I, let me, I'm going to give you a statement, and I don't, I don't think I've, maybe I have, I don't know if I've given you this statement, but this is a very big, huge statement in relationship to comprehending this whole thing about the firstborn. Remember, we started with the prodigal son. We saw the types and shadows in it. We, we, remember, we saw the father's face. Do you remember that? We saw the father's face when he's offering up the fatted calf and the prodigal son is going, oh my God, this is where his heart has been. And I've been thinking what he wants is me to be a big boy and go out in the world and do great things and he'll be proud of me. And, He's not. That's not what he's wanting. So, and then we went into uh, uh, Exodus, and we saw that there was a division between the firstborn and just Israel that came out. There was not one group. It wasn't just Israel. It was the firstborn that he wanted, and it was the firstborn that the lamb died for, or they would be dead. Do you remember that? And then Cain and Abel. Okay. And within those, maybe I, maybe I did mention this, so I'm just going to read this to you. Uh, let me back up here and say a few things in, in front of this. The whereby uh, of how shall this come about is the knowledge of the cross. That is the assurance and knowledge of the inheritance, of the inheritance. The cross is the knowledge of the inheritance. Now here comes the statement that I'm, I'm wanting to give to you tonight. In God's view, a person does not gain the inheritance from someone else who died, but is given to the son who dies. All right. Now, that's, that's totally contrary to the way that, you know, I mean, a father dies and gives his son the inheritance. We will see in every story as we move through this that that's the truth. That the, okay, look at the prodigal. The prodigal was the one who died, as it were, right? Abel was the one who died, as it were. We'll, we'll go on. We'll see. We'll see here. All right, so the statement is, again, I'll read it. In God's view, a person does not gain the inheritance from someone else who died, but is given to the son who dies. And that's going to be Jacob, 
and that's going to be Joseph, and that's going to be anyone else in the scripture. The one who dies is the one who gets the inheritance. Well, okay, so in the natural, we say, <clears throat> we say, well, that's stupid. <laughs> I mean, we go, if my father dies, I get it, but if I die, I don't get it. But we're not talking about the natural. We're talking about God's reality. We're talking about the son. We're talking about the son who did die and who is the heir of all things. Does not Hebrews, the first chapter, just blow that forth? He's the heir of all things. And, and um, uh, well, the, the other examples that we'll get to as we go. But I could literally go back and re-emphasize those things in relationship to those who died. For example, I just hate to jump ahead. I just hate to jump ahead. So I won't. But mark an asterisk beside that and say, Randy, tell us that in these other stories. <laughs> yeah, you said you would tell us because it's there. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, so God speaks to him, and he says, you know, take these different offerings and let them all together be the big offering. Let them all together give you the big picture of Christ crucified. Let it show, let it show forth all of the angles, because you know, surely you know, but you know that, you know, there was a sin offering, and everybody's familiar with the sin offering, and everybody's familiar with Jesus dying, doing the sin offering, and that is that, you know, we are saved because Jesus died for our sin, which was the sin offering. But there was a bunch of other offerings, and this is portraying that, and some of those offerings were, were this, where they were called sweet savor offerings. And as sweet savor offerings, who were they a sweet savor to? The Father. So you could stand there and go, I don't get it. Well, good. You're not the Father. You know, you know you're not supposed to get it. You're, but you're supposed to understand that's what he wants. And it is that to him. And it's for his good pleasure that you're offering. Right? So... So let it rise, amen? So, so these, all these different offerings are not just representing a sin offering. They are representing every angle of all the offerings that were set forth in the tabernacle that the people regularly came to the big altar, the main altar. There were no other altars. After, after, this, after Abraham and all them got through with this, when Moses came and they established in the wilderness the tabernacle, there was one altar, and God said, do not sacrifice on any other altars from now on. It, it, it probably looked like that one over there, the cross. It was, it was only one. See, we might, we might say, well, um, Lord, I crucify myself for you. That's so stupid, you know. I mean, you know. Uh, First of all, you, you couldn't do that. You know, it's like nail your feet up, nail this up, and then go, how do I nail this hand? You can't crucify yourself. It's made so that it, it's impossible. All right. So that means your death or your crucifixion is that you are crucified with Christ. And that's where you have to go to the main altar, which is really not the main altar. It's the only one. Right? So that we don't go to weird things about, you know, well, you know, I'm just suffering for Christ, you know, apart from his altar. No, no. We're crucified with Christ. We are dead with Christ. That's the whole reality, and we must go to the altar where he died, not the altar of our making in our own mind, you know. And I know people, I do, I know people that go, they, they, they kind of go, 
okay, I'm just, I'm going to give this up. And then, you know, you talk to them a week later and they go, well, I didn't go to that thing because it would have been fun. So I, you know, you're making your own altars, buddy. You know, we wouldn't want you to have any fun. You know, <laughs> I've had people when I'm doing conferences, I remember several in Latin America and you know, I'm talking about being dead with Christ and they come up and go, well, is that it then? There's no fun. We don't do any, you know, and our, you know, our personalities are dead and there's just, you know, we, and I said, do I look like, you know, I'm not having fun. <laughs> do I look like a guy that doesn't know how to have fun? I said, no, but you need to go to this right altar. You need to quit thinking in terms of, well, this, I'm going to build an altar instead of see what's done there, reckon on that and let it work in you. But that one, out of that one, see, there's life. But you, do, you start building these little altars that are, that are not really based on that. And you know, you can, yes, you can, you can have, as it were, little altars, but they're not. They're really the, based on the one, see? And as long as you're doing it based on the one, then you're still honoring God. But you're dishonoring God if you start building your own little altars. And there is no resurrection off of your, your altars. There's no life. And that's why people that do that, they end up getting lower and more, you know, and, oh, yeah, I just, I just love Jesus. <laughs> you're just going, dude. You know, wake up, wake up. <laughs> so, so that, that's what all of those things represent. All right, so um, let's see. I'm getting close to the end of this part, too. Um, <clears throat> so he presents the altar. Here God calls on his servant, talking about Abram, to offer every kind of of the main offerings that he will introduce to Israel, which, okay, so Abraham's doing all these, he's putting all these things down, and they're all going to be on the altar, and whether God said it or not, God could have said, everything that you're doing here, Israel will do in the tabernacle from now on until my son shows up. And Abraham might have gone, oh, my God, you're talking about all my, my seed. <laughs> I mean, in, the, in a real sense, in that sense, not spiritual sense, but Israel? Who's that? <laughs> well, he's coming. Joseph, he's coming. They're all coming. They'll come right on down to this guy named Joseph and Mary of whom was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. See, every one of them counted, but none of them in themselves was the answer. Right? From Abraham all the way down, all the way down till Christ came forth, he couldn't have come forth without this lineage. That's why the lineage is in there in Matthew 1. We go, okay, I'm gonna read the Bible, starting the New Testament, okay. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat. Please, how long is this going to go? Begat, so-and-so begat, you know. And uh, I, was, I don't remember where I was reading. I think it was yesterday. But, uh, and so-and-so begat twins, I think it was, Huzz and Buzz. Anybody remember Huzz and Buzz? <laughs> I went, okay, glad you got that in there, Lord. <clears throat> um, but the reality of Matthew 1 is it keeps going, it keeps going because the promise was to Abraham. So he begins with Abraham, starts going through, and it goes on down, and it goes on down. And uh, Joseph and Mary, of whom brought forth Christ. And you realize that the life of it was not them, but the vehicle of it was them. And then you realize we have this treasure in earthen vessels 
the life of it is not us, but the vehicle, uh, we are the vehicle of it. And so it's, so our, that's why our focus has to be on him. Because God never intended to have a wonderful Christianity that just pleases the heck out of him. He wanted the church which is his body. Because he wanted his son. Not just a church. Not just a church. But specifically the church. I'm looking for the church which is his body. That will carry him forth. Just like just like. Matthew 1. <clears throat> All right, I'm almost done here. And well should I be. Um, notice also that he does not present the sin offering, but every kind of offering that can be given. In other words, yes, sin offering is in there. But as I said, it's just the, it's the wrap up. It's the Unto Abraham, God is presenting the full picture of Christ crucified. And it'll be important later. It'll be important later. Later on, he's going to need to know this because he's going to be put in situation a situation that's going to require that reality that day right here to be real to him. And guess who else is going to be put in that situation? Well, we'll find out in the rest of the scriptures here. But Israel, all of Israel are going to be put. What's going on here is going to explode into the future of Israel. Father, we just ask you to make, make these things real in us, not just to us. Don't just teach us deep things, but that we might grasp that we might be grasped of the very life and the very heart of the things that moved you to even bring about creation. The very things that are, will always be the thing that is important to you regardless of how many lives come and go, regardless of how many nations rise and fall, regardless of how many toys are created or how many people and their jobs come and go, that this will be your heart and this will be what your plan is always about. Make it real. Make it really him in us. And may we with all of our heart, because you, even to the Jews you said, when they said, what, you know, tell us what you want, you said to them to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and strength. That was your first thing. That's the first thing that you wanted them to grasp. And we do that by the by the very spirit of Christ, the son in us finds true love, the true kind of selfless love to give back to you and to give to others. So we, we ask, we seek, we cry out, we long for that not just that Jesus would increase in us, but that we would G decrease also and that there'll be no increase of your son unless we decrease also. And that we understand that and we, we go to the altar and we just, we lay what needs to be laid on that altar of ourselves so that off the altar comes the slain lamb. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty.